if you would open your Bibles to that passage, John 13. Familiar story, Jesus washing his disciples' feet. But I want to warn you beforehand, there is more here than meets the eye. And so we're going to take a deep dive, Lord willing, into the riches of this example. I've given you an example to follow. So if you would, uh, let's ask God to, to bless the reading and preaching and hearing of his word. Jesus, we thank you that you are the good shepherd, that we all come needy people, needy sheep before you. And Jesus, you know precisely what each and every sheep needs. And so, Lord, I, I ask that you would provide that, that you would strengthen your people, wash them again, help them, guide them, give them assurance. And Lord, we trust that by your blood you have purchased these good things for us. And Lord, we ask that you could open our ears, that we might not just be hearers of the word, but doers as well. We pray this in Christ's precious name. Amen. A scholar, D.A. Carson, shares about some friends of his who had become foster parents. They had recently taken in twins who were two years old. Both were born into poverty. Uh, they had been passed around about 17 different homes before landing with this foster couple. And unfortunately, they had in their 17 homes been abused both emotionally and even sexually. And it explained why these two children came to the foster parents as tiny, dysfunctional savages. They wouldn't talk, and they were violent and hateful. Being unloved themselves, it obviously made them incapable of expressing love for others and in, the, in any meaningful sense at all. It's a reminder, friend, that there is a clear cause to loveless people in the world. Why do people in this world hate one another? Well, because unloved two-year-olds become unloved 20-year-olds and unloved 80-year-olds. And unloved people don't love people. And the fact is, this is even more true, and even in the most ultimate sense, when it comes to the love of God. The root of all lovelessness in this world is not merely the lack of receiving human love, as important as that is. The true root of lovelessness is a lack of awareness a lack of understanding, a lack of receiving God's love for you. And so lovelessness in your life becomes a clear and convincing proof that you are not in touch with the love of God for you. So how is your heart toward others this morning? How is your heart toward your spouse, your family, your employer, your children, other church members? Are you murmuring, bitter, unforgiving, holding a grudge, inflexible, tyrannical, oppressive, angry, violent, judgmental, domineering? Is your heart icy cold toward other people? believers, other people? If so, you need to understand, dear friend, that the root cause of your lovelessness is not that you have merely broken divine law, but that you are out of touch with God's divine love, his love for you. In fact, God's love, you might say, is somewhat like the sun, the S-U-N, rays of sun, whatever it strikes, it transmits its own heat to that which it hits, 
to that which it comes into contact with. And a warm heart that is filled with love for others is the result of God's warm love coming into contact with your soul. God is love, John says in 1 John. And in this gospel, John has labored to show you that the full and final manifestation of who God is is found in the person of Jesus Christ. If you want to know what the love of God looks like, you need to examine and understand Jesus Christ and how he has loved you. Now, this is exactly what John wants to show you in this vivid portrait of Jesus Christ loving his disciples. Uh, notice verse 1 here in, verse thir- in chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he washed their feet. No, he loved them to the end. This foot washing episode is love. Now, the other gospel accounts tell us that at the table, at this meal, Jesus will institute the Passover. What we do each Sunday, we take the bread and the cup, we share in this memorial meal, reminding ourselves of the death of Jesus Christ. John doesn't record that institution here. Rather, John probably assumes you've read the other Gospels, you know about the institution of the supper. John instead, he wants to show you the motive, the heart of Jesus that drove him to break his body and pour out his blood, namely love. The cross of Jesus, it is the climactic act of divine love for you. It means, beloved, you must not read this foot-washing scene merely as a way that you should imitate uh, his love and go and do it uh, yourselves. I mean, that's why, for example, we don't have basins of water here for you to kind of wash your feet before, you know, as you come in and leave. This is a, a figurative example of how the love of Christ is poured out on the cross. Having said that, there clearly is this piece where we imitate the heart of what Jesus has done here. This, this is a practical act of service, isn't it? I mean, in ancient Jerusalem, everyone walks around on dirt roads with sandals. Okay, so, so households, they, they would have these water basins probably at the front door, and guests coming in, they could take off their sandals, have their feet washed, I don't know if you're like me, but I do not like going, walking outside, even like in my driveway without shoes. Like barefoot on the driveway, I get back inside, it feels chalky and dusty and uh, nasty. But to wash, soothing, isn't it? It's refreshing. It's the kind of service Jesus is doing for his disciples. And and notice Jesus is going to make this an example of how you Christians should follow him. Uh, Jesus will say this, "If, if I then your teacher and Lord have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Now again, Jesus is not mandating a foot-washing ceremony or a foot-washing sacrament. Some branches of the church have taken it that way. And I strongly disagree with that. And the reason is primarily because of verse 34. Drop your eyes down to verse 34 of chapter 13. Listen to the similar language. Here's what Jesus says to his disciples. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another Just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. You hear the similar language. You should wash each other's feet. How? Just as I wash your feet. But what does that mean? A new commandment I've given you. That you love each other. How? As I have loved you. So here's the point. You need Christian You need to understand and receive the love of Jesus for you, which will empower and inform the way you love other disciples. 
And so that's how we're gonna get at this text here. We're gonna go through it and consider, how did Jesus love you? And from how Jesus loved us, we're going to see the implication of how we should love others. So let's get at this. How has Jesus loved you? Jesus has loved you with a discerning, choosing, enduring, self-debasing, purifying love. Let's look at these first. Jesus has loved you, beloved, with a discerning love. Now, John tells us here twice that Jesus knows it is his time to depart and be with the Father. See that in verse one, his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. And then you see that in verse three, Jesus knowing uh, that he's, he had come from God and going back to God. It's time for Jesus to die. This is Thursday night. He will die Friday, rise Sunday, and then ascend back to the Father in heaven, which will leave his disciples alone. He will no longer be physically present with his people. Knowing this, he loves them. Now, as you know, Danielle and I just went to a conference out in Kentucky, and we left our three-year-old here behind, and before we left, there we are in the home. We got our bags packed in the, in the garage, the car packed, we're ready to go, and there's little Titus, we're taking little Piper with us, and we say, peace out, and we leave. <laughs> of course we didn't do that. Three-year-old, you would terrorize a three-year-old if you did that. No, we, we took our time to explain to him, Mama and Dad, I love you. We're going out of town. We'll be right back. We're going to put you in capable hands. We'll be a phone call away. We'll be back soon. Give him a little instruction, a little encouragement. It's loving him, knowing the need of the hour, what he needs because of our departure. That's the kind of thing Jesus is doing right here. Jesus knows that his departure will cause his disciples to undergo a great trial. Knowing this, he washes their feet. It's his way of preparing them to not be crushed by this tribulation coming upon them, but to thrive after he leaves. Now, there's many ways you can see that in this text. I'm gonna give you a couple. First, you, you hear this issue of uh, Judas betraying Jesus. Judas was one of the best friends that these disciples had, and Jesus knows that his betrayal of Messiah will rattle the faith of his people to the core. Maybe Christ, maybe Jesus wasn't the Christ after all. I mean, he couldn't even keep his best friend around. No, Jesus here is going to prophesy that uh, this betrayal fulfills Scripture. So drop your eyes down to verse 18. And, and listen to how Jesus prepares his people knowing they need to be held up when this trial comes upon them. Verse 18, I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place that when it does take place, you may believe I am the divine name. And so Judas hands Jesus to the authorities who in turn kill them. Faith is rattled. Is he really Messiah? They are to remember this foot washing episode and remember the words of Jesus right here. I chose Judas specifically to fulfill Psalm 41, 9. Messiah must be betrayed by one of his close companions, even someone who ate bread at his table. So when it all plays out, their faith is strengthened. Jesus did not fail. Je Jesus pulled this off out of his own sovereign control. He's the I am. Only Jesus, only God in the flesh can fulfill scripture like this. And so this foot washing becomes this token 
to serve their faith in crisis. His faith is discerning, beloved. He knows the needs of the hour. And as Jesus has loved us, we ought to love one another. Which means, Christian, your love for each other ought to be a discerning love. Philippians 1 says it this way, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. It means you must learn the, the needs, the, the, the God-oriented needs of other, beloveds and other brothers and sisters in this congregation before you can love them. Or else your attempt to love them might actually cause them issues, pain. It might not be received as love. It might go haywire. It's like uh, pin the tail on the donkey. Kids, you know pin the tail on the, do- on the donkey, don't you? There it is. Poor donkey, no tail. How sad. But there you are. You got the tail. You're going to help him out. You're going to put it right where it needs to go. And... Unfortunately, though, you stab him in the eye. (laughs) Why? You're blindfolded. And sometimes we try to love each other in the the church, stabbing people in the eye because we don't know what they really need. (laughs) I want to love you this way. That hurt. (laughs) Proverbs 27, 14 gives a wonderful example of this. Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice Rising early in the morning will be counted as cursing them. Just ask my wife about what that means. <laughs> hey, you can say all the right things at the wrong time or all the right things in the wrong way. And you hurt them. And this proverb says, that's your fault because you haven't done the necessary work of getting to know what they need. Beloved, this is a call for you to be in meaningful relationship with brothers and sisters in the Lord. You need to work hard to know them so you can discern their needs and love them with discernment. Jesus loves us with discernment, we should too. Second, Jesus has loved you, beloved, with a choosing love. A choosing love. Uh, John here is going to go out of his way to tell you about Judas and isolate Judas from this group of people Jesus loves. Notice carefully verse 2 here. During the supper when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. It's an interesting comment by John. He's, he's putting it in here, perhaps to suggest that take a pause on Judas. Perhaps Judas does not belong to this group of disciples in the very same way as the 11. And in fact, that's what Jesus goes on about after washing his disciples' feet. Notice what he says in verse 9 about Judas. He says to them, he's washed them, and look what, halfway through verse 9, look at it carefully. Talking to the, the 12 here. And you are clean, all of you are clean, but not all of you. You are clean, but not all of you. What does that mean? For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. Isn't this interesting? Jesus is isolating Judas. You 11 are clean, but Judas is not. Which is interesting given the fact that Jesus literally scrubs Judas' feet. Literally, physically, Judas is washed clean. But he says Judas is not clean. It's, It's obvious what Jesus is saying here. There is a metaphorical way in which he has not cleansed Judas, there's a deeper cleansing that does not apply to this man whom Jesus chose to fulfill scripture to be the son of destruction. It means Jesus here, or Judas, is not the object of Jesus' act of love in the same way 
as the 11. It's why John uses the possessive idea to describe this act of love. Did you catch it? Having loved his own. You see that? Having loved his own in the world, verse one, he loved them to the end. It echoes John's theology of election that he's been teaching us. God the Father has given God the Son a people, a flock, a bride, and Jesus Christ sets his special redeeming love upon each and every one of them and ensures that each and every one of them gets washed. It means, beloved, Jesus Christ did not merely love humanity as a nameless blob. To be sure, Jesus loves all humanity. In fact, Jesus says, church, if you don't love your enemies, God haters, you have something less than Christian love. But Jesus Christ has something more than mere love for humanity. Jesus Christ loves his own with a special, particular, redeeming, cherishing love. If you are in Christ, beloved, it means he loved you. He chose you. He called you. He washed you. He saved you. And beloved, think about you going through any trials right now, any pain, any suffering, any difficulty. Jesus knows and loves you. Paul will say, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He will give you exactly what you need in your trial because he saved you. He died for you. He loved you. He loved you by name. Now that's a great assurance for us. But it also, in a way, shapes how we love one another. Notice that this new commandment is specific. It, it narrows down beyond love for the world. Uh, listen to it again in verse 34. He says, a new commandment I give you, he's talking to his disciples, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are to love one another. Doesn't mean we withhold love from outsiders. But Jesus clearly here is saying that we are to have a special and particular love for the church, for the believer. That's why you read the New New Testament. It is filled with fleshing out this new commandment. You are to use your spiritual gifts to edify the faith of the saints. Or here we have a lazy brother or sister. Paul says, exhort them. Come on. Get going, serving the Lord. Or if you see a needy brother and sister, you have a particular responsibility to use your resources to lift them up. Or you know a brother or sister who's guilt-ridden by past sins, you point them to the glories of the cross. These are special ways, read the New Testament, special ways that we can only love believers. And when you love believers like Jesus loved you, what is happening is Christ himself is loving the church through you. And so we ought to focus our Christ-centered love on each other. Third, Jesus loved you with an enduring love. A love that lasts. A love that doesn't quit. A love that keeps going. Hear the language again in verse 1 having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That is to say, to the end of Jesus' earthly time with his disciples. Jesus is in, the, is in the hour of his end before he departs and goes to the Father. And what this means here is that Jesus Christ is in the shadow of the cross, isn't he? Chapter 12 tells us that his soul is in agony. And it has been said well that if there was any time when Jesus Christ should focus on his own needs, any time that he should ask the disciples to be all about him, 
for the disciples to wash his feet. Wouldn't it be now? I mean, in our nation, criminals on death row, they at least get to choose their last meal. Shouldn't Jesus get to choose the menu for his last supper? His love is incredible. Jesus Christ facing the horrors of the cross is deeply concerned about the well-being of his sheep. And if you want to add to it, Jesus knows that every last one of his sheep are not incredible disciples, squeaky clean, who are going to stand with him to the last each and every one of them will abandon him, fail him. Jesus Christ knows it. Uh, 1432, he prophesies, behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Things get hard. They want to go get some pizza on the couch. I'm out. Safety, security. And Jesus loved them to the end. In fact, this might be why he washes their feet. You do realize the instrument of their biggest failure is their feet. I'm going home. I'm quitting on Jesus. And Jesus here comes to them and washes the place of their worst failure. And then he restores them. He returns to them after the resurrection, commissions them, commissions them push, puts the gospel in their mouths and said, hey, your feet are beautiful because you're gonna go preach me. Jesus restores failures. He loves them to the end. You got any failures? What, what is your greatest sin? You might not even know. Your greatest sin might be ahead of you, Jesus knows. And Jesus will continue to love you even there, even when you fail him. He will come to you and, and chase after you and woo you to repentance and he will restore you to himself and wash you and forgive you and say, you go and you preach me and you go talk about the Jesus who can forgive even the worst sinner like yourself. It's why we believe in what's called the preservation of the saints. Christian, Jesus will come to you again and again and again and again and forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and love and love and love and love and wash and wash and wash and wash until you're with him in glory. He will love you to the end. Which, which is why quitting on other Christians is so outside the gospel. I'm out of here. They sinned against me. What is that? We know nothing of the love of Jesus if we abandon our spouse because it's hard or if we leave the church because I got my, my toe stepped off. We know nothing of bearing with each other, forgiving, washing. Paul says, we bear with one another. If one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other, the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. We don't quit. We stick to it. We return to our brother and sister to restore them and wash them and tell them that sin against me, it's nailed to the cross, it's gone. Fourth, Jesus has loved you with a self-debasing love. A self-debasing love. John tells you that Jesus knows something else, not merely that he's gonna depart, he knows something about his true greatness and this is something we can relate to, we walk around and we know all about our true awesomeness, don't we? I mean, nobody has to tell me how awesome I am. <laughs> Except, uh, that's the sin of pride. But for, G for Jesus, it wasn't the sin of pride because, uh, well, notice verse three, how, how John says it. Look at verse three here. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. That's what Jesus is thinking before he goes and washes his disciples' feet. The Father has given me everything in my hand as an image for control and authority. It's probably a reference to creation. Jesus is the eternal Son of God, the divine agent by which God creates all things. So the Son creates all things, and then the Father rewards him and exalts him by placing 
all creation into the sovereign control of Jesus. It means Jesus Christ literally is king of the world. And Jesus knows it. But knowing his exalted status above all creation, it does not prevent Jesus Christ from meeting the need of the hour. Because for Jesus to love his own people, he must embrace humiliation beyond anything that, that we know. Verse four, Jesus, knowing his greatness, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, get the scene in your mind. These disciples are reclining at table. Table is probably about a foot tall. They're lying on mats, probably on their side, which means their legs are sprawled out behind them. So Jesus, stripping off these robes, these outer clothing, symbolic of his dignity, takes up this towel, wrap, wraps it around his waist. He must bend as low as physically possible in order to access their feet and wash it with water. Which means apparently their feet were dirty and needed to be washed. Now, the other gospel accounts tell us that these disciples were running around town trying to set up this upper room so that Jesus could take the Lord's Supper or the Passover with his disciples. So they've been stomping around these dirt roads. And do you recall what is going on during Passover in Jerusalem at this time? The whole nation descend or ascends into the city. And it's time to sacrifice animals. Cattle, pigeons if you're poor, oxen. Like farm every, I mean there's animals literally everywhere. It means that these disciples likely have like on their feet, it's crusted with dirt and sweat and animal poop. I don't know what, the, what your spouse's feet smell like. It's nothing compared to this. <laughs> nothing. It's gross, nasty. Which is why in the day here, this work was reserved for a person occupying the lowest status in society, a slave. Knowing he's king of the world. He becomes a slave for the sake of love. It so clearly foreshadows the descent of shame onto the cross. Jesus leaving heaven, becoming a man, and going to the cross willingly to embrace public scorn, and worse, to be treated as a sinner, though he had no sin, so that he could take the wrath of God upon himself so that he could substitute himself for all of his sinful people. The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me, though I'm the king of the world. Beloved, Jesus becomes the scum of the earth in your place for the sake of loving you. How deep is his love for you? And we should love others in the church in a similar manner. In fact, Jesus Christ ties this self-debasing kind of love directly to the new commandment. Uh, look, look at verse 12, how he connects this humility. When he had washed their feet and he put on his outer garments, resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, you say I have authority? And you're right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought, binding obligation, you must, you ought 
to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. You're awesome. You are awesome. I know it. The sake of love calls you to take a lowly position, to wash the feet of a brother or sister in need. I'm too awesome for that. That attitude says, I'm greater than Jesus. But the love of Christ, when you recognize how far he went down to serve you, we say, I'm not even willing to wash Jesus' feet like John the Baptist. I'm not even willing to take the sandals off of Jesus. There's nothing I won't do to serve my Lord even if it means being a slave for the good of other believers. Finally, beloved, Jesus has loved you with a purifying love, a purifying love. Jesus goes to each disciple, perhaps going around the rectangular table, goes to each one, standing up, sitting down, standing up, going down, Finally, he, re- he uh, approaches Peter. And when he comes to Peter, this great rock, the leader of the 12, it sparks this dialogue between Jesus and Peter. And so let's look at this dialogue, first in Peter's misplaced zeal, and then secondly, we'll look at Jesus' figurative washing. So notice, Peter's misplaced zeal, verse 6 He comes to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Hmm, interesting response. Sounds zealous, sounds appropriate, perhaps. Only, in the next phrase, you will find how serious and potentially angry Peter actually is. Jesus responds, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will understand Afterward, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. It is an absolute refusal. The language is strong. Peter is saying, you never wash my feet forever. (laughs) Doesn't matter how often you try, Jesus, I will never let you wash me. So Jesus has struck a nerve in Peter's soul, but here's what's fascinating. We we think of... uh, I need to bring this up. Politicians who flip-flop, you know, their positions to get votes. P- Peter here flip-flops his policy, like, immediately. W- watch what he says. Jesus responds, as, uh, uh, if I don't wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then, uh, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. <laughs> wash all of me. What? Never. Wait, change my mind. All of me. How do you explain the uh, flip-flop of policy in Peter's mind with respect to Jesus washing him? Peter's headstrong. He's not pliable. He's not wishy-washy. Jesus tells us Peter does not understand Jesus. He doesn't understand Jesus. So we must ask, what is it about Jesus that Peter does not yet understand? A misunderstanding that accounts for both policies. And here's the answer. Peter believes that as Messiah, Jesus is a military hero who came to conquer with the sword and not with a towel. And especially not with a cross. You will never wash me. Why? Because you're king, you're conqueror, and I need to preserve your status as the ruler and king and conquering general that you really are. And then Jesus says, wait, if if I don't wash you now, you have no share with me. And I think probably Peter interprets Jesus ceremonially. Don't forget, they're at the table to celebrate the Passover, and the Jews would wash themselves, they would purify themselves so that they could be qualified to take the supper. So probably Peter's thinking, wait, if the king doesn't wash me, then uh, I don't get a share in his kingdom? Fine, Jesus, Uh, I got some defilement on my head and my hands. Uh, 
Wash all of me so that I can rule with you. I'm ready to die for you. Let's go conquer the Romans together. And my support for this argument is, uh, is this. What did, G- what did Peter unleash in the Garden of Gethsemane when soldiers descended upon him? A sword. And he went swinging. And he got a guy's ear. Peter misunderstands the person of Jesus. Jesus is not a conquering military hero now. Jesus is the Messiah, yes. He's the suffering servant of God. Peter misunderstands the mission of Jesus. Jesus comes for the first time to die on the cross. And Peter, perhaps most importantly, misunderstands his deepest need to have his soul cleansed from the stain of sin. So what about Jesus' figurative washing? Well, Jesus tells Peter that he will understand what Jesus is doing afterwards. But more literally, it should be rendered after these things. What things? I'm washing you, Peter. You don't understand what I'm doing, but afterward, after these things, you will understand it. Well, this scene right here is an introduction to what's been called the farewell discourse. Jesus spends three chapters discipling and teaching his people, and Jesus makes it very clear what he means. Jesus will die, ascend to the Father, and then send the Holy Spirit from heaven into the hearts of these disciples, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. Peter will finally understand what Jesus is doing when the Spirit of God indwells his soul, illuminates his mind, so that Peter can understand the redemptive love and washing of Jesus. So in light of the cross and the resurrection, what Jesus means is plain, isn't it? Peter, unless I die to wash away the defilement of your sin before God, you will not inherit eternal life with me, so you must not reject a crucified Messiah. Instead, you need to see that your deepest need is to be cleansed from that which truly defiles you before a holy God, your sinful heart. You need to be reconciled with God the Father, and only I can do that by my precious blood to unite you and to a share with a relationship with the Father. It means Jesus does know the true need of the hour, doesn't he? His disciples don't need to get stinky dirt off the feet. They need defiling sin out of the heart. In fact, I think that's probably what Jesus is getting at. He makes this interesting distinction. The one who has a bath doesn't need his feet washed, or doesn't need his whole body washed, just his feet. I think probably Jesus is speaking on Peter's terms. Away with this idea of external ceremonial washing, that's not the kind of washing I'm talking about talking about a cleansing in your soul and only my death on the cross can wash you free from sin the blood of Jesus purifies your soul in order to bring you into fellowship with God that's how he's loved you Christian so how do you imitate this kind of love well in a way you can't Jesus alone shed his blood to wash away sin but you can preach him. You can tell your children about him. You can tell your employer about him. And so I want to end with two exhortations, one for the unbeliever and one for the believer. For the unbeliever, the exhortation is, Jesus can wash you. Believe in Jesus Christ. Notice verse 17, how he says it. I'm sorry, verse 20, look at it. Unbeliever, this verse is for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So here we are. The apostles have preached Jesus and left it in the Bible for us. How did they turn out? Almost all of them were martyred and hated by the world. And they spent their time before that being like slaves to one another, washing each other's feet. Does that sound like something you want to be in on? But notice what Jesus says. 
if you receive the message of the apostles, you receive Christ. And if you receive Christ, you receive the one who sent Christ God. You receive this lowly Messiah who died a, a slave kind of death. You get united to God. God the Father, God the Son comes to live in your soul. There is no greater love than this for you to have God in your soul, and only Jesus can do it. Receive the message, and you'll receive God. Believer, I want to sum this up by saying this. Your attempt to love other disciples is difficult, hard, at times very stinky. <laughs> Amen, anyone? We're a community of people who still have sin. And so we're gonna continue to fail each other. But the Lord Jesus has said, you go out there, love patiently, love your spouse patiently, keep forgiving, keep pointing them to Jesus, and don't stop. It's hard, it's not easy, but Jesus gives you an encouragement. Verse 17, this is for you. If you know these things, Blessed are you if you do them. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. It doesn't mean if you do these, you earn salvation and earn a blessing. No, here's what it means. If you're loving, taking up the towel, it's hard, it's stinky, it's messy, but I'm in it, I'm going, you already are blessed. You are already in a favored position with God the Father. And so what you need to do to endure is you must return again and again to how Jesus has loved you. You will never love the church, the stinky church, to the end unless you are returning over and over and over, over again and how Jesus Christ loved you on the cross. He loved you to the depths. And knowing that love, experiencing that love, you'll have everything you need to love loveless people. Those uh, two terrorist children I told you about, the two-year-olds, the foster parents love them with Christian love, patience, firmness, teaching, discipline. And with, within two years, they were finally placed with adoptive parents and their temperament and their conduct had completely changed. They were healthy four-year-olds, happy four-year-olds. It is what love does. Love transforms. And Jesus died to bring the love of God into your very soul. So if you receive Jesus Christ, you will become like him in your love for Christ and your love for others. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the deepest hell. Are you in the deepest hell? Only his love can reach you there. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the ocean of your love. If we could see and taste it, we would be eager to love you in return and to love the disciples you've put into our lives. I pray, Father, that you would, in your kindness, make us understand how deep, how wide, how long, how high is the love of Christ for sinners like us. And help us go love likewise in Christ's precious name. Amen.